I can tell when I flush a toilet what is stuck in there. <laughs> and people don't believe me. I'm like, it's a driver's license. Yeah. It's got like a certain gurgle and then like it stops and then it fills up. It's driver's license. That That's the kind of stuff. These are the kinds of skills you acquire along the way that no right. one really gets to be privy to. Yeah. Welcome to the Morse Code Podcast, where we talk with entrepreneurially minded creatives in music, film, and writing. My name is Corby, and I'm hoping these conversations inspire you to push deeper into your own work, whether you're a full-time professional or just starting out on your own creative odyssey. Before I get to our guest, the Morse Code Podcast is celebrating its six-month anniversary with a live show. That's happening Sunday, April 14th at the Five Spot here in East Nashville. Many of the guests we've had on the show are performing that night. Guests like Jill Andrews, Abigail Compst, Lamont Coleman, Boo Ray, James Kyson, and loads more. I'll probably even get up there and do a song or two. Tickets go on sale March 4th at my website, CorbyLenker.com. Okay, not to brag, but that's pretty much a perfect segue to our guest, Todd Sherwood. He's the owner and lead talent booker at The Five Spot. Not only is that where the anniversary show is gonna be, but The Five Spot is the legendary club of East Nashville, a place I've played countless times over 20 years. I've also seen some of the best shows of my life there. The recent Joe Pisapia residency comes to mind. Todd has run the club since taking it over from the old owners back in the aughts. One of the reasons I'm excited about this conversation is because we get in to the history of the club, a story that doesn't exist anywhere on the internet, not on the Five Spot website, nothing. Todd tells some hilarious stories about the realities of running a successful rock club for 20 years, and he has some practical advice for bands and artists who book shows at his or really any small club in terms of making it a positive experience for everybody. If you get something out of the Morse Code podcast, please take a second to like and subscribe. It really does help. And now here's my conversation with Todd Sherwood. Todd Sherwood. Hello. Hello. Thanks so much for your time, man, and stopping by, making sure, the man. long trek yep. all of four blocks. It's, over it here took to me studio. about 45 seconds to get here. Yeah. I noticed that. Well, you sent me a text on my way, and I was like, oh, shit. And I got it like two minutes later. I'm like, this is pointless. Yeah, to and I didn't to. even leave for a, a, a good few minutes. We were already here. <clears throat> yeah, I was having a meeting with Derek Hoke. Oh, nice. You know Derek Yeah, Hoke. I mean, he ran the Tuesday night Tuesday or $2 Tuesdays for how long? For seven? 13 years. 13. Um, so we were just talking about what we want to do in the future since we're not doing $2 Tuesday anymore. And before that, I was meeting with some other musicians. And everyone lives right here in the neighborhood. Uh, Perfect. It's nice. Yeah. And now I mean, throwing this in here. In the spirit of the community, this is just another thing on your list of things to do. Yep. Which... I gave Junebug 10 bucks. Do you know Junebug? No, I don't. He's the neighborhood guy that's like, there he is. Hey, can I get two bucks? I gave him 10 bucks today. Wow. Which is rare. That's, um, that's what you had on you. Now I cut him off on his birthday because I posted something on the neighborhood Facebook page. It's June bugs birthday. Holler happy birthday to him. When you see him on the corner at five points and somebody raised like 350 bucks wow. uh, and on that page to give to him. He and, loved that. And so everyone made me go and give it to him because I'm <laughs> friends with him. And I was like, June Bug, I have 350 bucks for you. Happy birthday. Uh, Little did you know. And he was very happy. I found out a, a lot about him. He was, a, he was in the army. A bomb went off next to him. He's got brain damage. So that's why he's on the corner. Mm. Uh, but I was like... 350 bucks just leave me alone for like a week because i have a lot to do and you just come in and you just you don't leave me alone until i give you 10 bucks give me a week and he was there the next day <laughs> being like hey man i need nine bucks i was like well, he's got brain damage and i have to always remember that yeah like okay but i cut him off and then today uh i gave him 10 bucks you turned him on yeah uh, well, Anyways. you're a good soul, man, <laughs> and, uh, a, community, a pillar of the community. No, you really are. Okay. So let me, let's just jump into this. Cause my first question is what would compel you in it or anyone to open a rock club? Well, I was not the, I'm not the original owner. 
uh, I was helping 2002 or three or four, sometime around there, I was helping out a, a restaurant that had a big room and I put a venue in that big room and they were a mess. That place shut down. Where was that place? Just it was curious. on 12th South. It had a really stupid name. Uh, uh, what was it that? It was name? called Hair of the Dog because it was supposed to be like a brunch spot. Uh-huh. So people would come in and get Hair of the Dog. I mean, Whatever. it's not that bad. I enjoy a Hair of the Dog now. Yeah, but it, it became a nightclub called Hair of the Dog <laughs> for with bands playing every night. Yeah. Because I helped build the, the stage room. and all that. And, um, there used to be, before MySpace and Facebook and everything, there was NashvilleZine.com, yeah. which is a little forum so people could, you couldn't even post pictures in it. It was just, this is an online forum. Um, when that club shut down, the people at the Five Spot read it, and I lived in a neighborhood, and they just asked if I would come and work there. So I worked there for two years. Uh Tornado came in 2006. Oh, that one. Yeah. And it took uh, Bones and Diane's house. Bones and Diane are the original owners that built the five spot. They graciously brought me in to help run the place. They lost their home in a tornado. They had to step back. Diane was getting a uh, degenerative brain disease that Mm -hmm. no one knew what it was. So, um, well, that was later. Travis and I buy into the business just to take over for him for next to nothing. Like they were very generous with us. They just kind of passed it on to us. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we had to get, they didn't have a liquor license or anything like that. So we had to get liquor license, new beer permits and kind of go through the process of opening up a new place, even though it was already had been there. The name was there. The room was there. The Mm -hmm. stage was in the same spot. The bar was in the same spot. Bar was in the same spot. We didn't change any of like the uh, hard infrastructure. So, uh, was this would this have been back in the time of like uh, the slow bar, or is mm-hmm. this a little after that? Oh well, no, it was after Three slow Crows. Bar. Still are there. This Travis and I bought in in like t- end of two thousand six, mm. which we just had the five spot just had its twenty year anniversary. Congrats, man! Party. Well, that was last year. Just did. So. Kind of, yeah. So we're almost up to 21 years. Uh, but Travis and I have been the main operators since 2007, and which is still a long time. I was 27 years old with like the keys to a bar. And they're like, How did you manage you go. to survive? You that? run this place. 27 year olds are better than 25 year olds, but it's still only two years better. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so did you have, um, okay, so back up a little bit more than that. Do, were you in bands growing up? Were you interested in music? Did your parents play? What, why did, did you start to hang, you know, hanging around rock culture? Um, I bounced around from colleges, ended up at MTSU, uh, got, went to school for the recording industry and the music biz. And, uh, I don't know. I, uh, 2004, 2003, I started running sound, live sound. Mm. They don't teach you that at MTSU or any, at the time they didn't teach that at any school. You just had to, you could either do it or you couldn't. So 2004, it was me and Frank Sass and, oh good. The guy from the end, the big dude from the end, Brad, uh, and a few other really big dudes physically, statu- physically and speaking. way older than me. And they didn't like me, but I started kind of weaseling my way into running sound at all these different places in Nashville, small places. Um, the place I was trying to open up hair of the dog, uh, radio cafe oh, yeah. up here. Uh, First place I ever played, uh, the muse oh, I ran man. sound there a bunch of times. I don't remember the muse. It's now a Domino's. It's on fourth <laughs> by the interstate, but it was like metal bands, punk bands, mm. underage stuff. Um, so I was just uh, running sound, live sound every mm. night for 
a few years. Yep. So this it was kind of like a natural uh, progression, you could say. Mm -hmm. and, and like so many things that happen in life, you know, some are scripted or intended or striven for, and some just kind of are thrust upon you. And it sounds, you know, it's like, sounds like in your case, as in mine, it's sort of a combination of those two things, like responding to circumstances and doing your best to make the best decision you can. Yeah. I wasn't a kid. Like I hope to someday I grow up and I get to fix toilets at a music venue <laughs> and then repair a refrigerator and then email bands from around the world for the rest of my waking moments. Uh, no, I was not imagining that it all just kind of happened, but it happened so long ago. You know, yeah. with I'm 44, almost 44 now. And I was yeah. 20, you don't look like a 44 year old 20, rock club owner. Uh, I try, I try and get the mustache out to really establish my old dadness. But <laughs> uh, 23 running sound every night, and and then 27 being the owner operator of a bar music venue. Yeah. And now I'm 44, still doing the same thing, except hopefully I'm doing it better. <laughs> Maybe. I think so. Yeah. It's a lot. It's, it's a lot. You kind of have to be a neurotic, like psychopath to do it all. There's just so many moving parts and just, it's, it like is. A, it's an organizational job. It's like you, keeping, it's like a practical, like nickels and dimes approach to keeping the website current, promoting uh, the shows, uh, dealing with people all the time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like I, my whole life involves making people happy. Uh, yeah. And Customers like a pain. lot of people. Like, yeah. I'm it's, and sometimes it gets to me and I might snap, but from all the moving parts from, let's say we have five bands playing on a Wednesday night. I have t two bands play six to eight and three bands play nine to 12. I have all those bands. Each band has a bunch of people. I have to cater to each one of those people, the bass player and one of many people I have to make them happy. Uh, and then there's staff I have to make sure the staff is living good lives and get making enough money to survive and then there's the customers and they have to all be very happy you have to do everything for them and answer all their questions that they have and then below that you have your infrastructure your toilets your coolers your roof the stage lights the pa system the landlord or do you own the building um original owner bones was married to Diane. Diane passed away from something similar to ALS. Mm -hmm. It was a long, kind of depressing five years there. But he, they own the building. He still owns the building. He's still a partner, um, just kind of a stand back partner. Um, he's meaning you're fixing the roof. <laughs> well, I was fixing the roof for a very long time until recently. He was he agreed to put on a new roof and it's amazing because mm. I had tr for years, no one ever saw this. No one knows what I do in the daytime. No one knows till now. But for so many years, the roof, the ceiling, you would walk in and if you really looked, you would see that there was trash bags all over like clamped and taped to the rafters to collect leaks. And I had them all guttered and going in certain directions to go into one spot where there was a drain. Which is its own kind of a genius. And no, because I mean. <laughs> I'm like, the roof is leaking. And it just never got fixed. But I would do this. It probably prolonged. It was probably why Bones is like, I don't need a roof. Todd will probably duct tape some trash bags to the ceiling and it'll be okay. Uh, that kind of stuff. Yes. Every day. Uh, and part of the, I don't even remember what the original, well, uh, we were talking about, you know, all the moving parts and all the people that you have to make happy. Oh, and so yeah, yeah. there's the bands, there's the customers. And then there's this like shellac of alcohol over everything too. Right. And late nights, yes. which is a whole other element of chaos. Yes. That's where, okay. You can be very ambitious and a hardworking person, but if you can't party hard and then get through it the next day, 
in rough shape. You're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. Yeah. So I am a, I've been doing it a long time. Yeah. So there's a work hard, play hard component <laughs> that you, you know, embody. Yes. Or, All of the work is for a, for a party. Mm-hmm. Like every, every single little thing that I do ensures that people will have a fun time at night coming up soon maybe yeah. in 15 minutes when we have to open and i'm got the toilet off of the floor and i'm, <laughs> and I'm getting out like a pair of glasses or a driver's license i can tell when i flush a toilet what is stuck in there <laughs> and people don't believe me i'm like it's a driver's license yeah it's got like a certain gurgle and then like it stops and then it fills up it's driver's license that that's the kind of stuff. these are the kinds of skills you acquire along the way that no right. one really gets to be privy to yeah like if i had to go to a college and be like a guest speaker like oh so you guys want to get in the music business well you should talk to plumbers and just find out what they're doing the whole time that they're working on stuff and electricians most places probably call a plumber and then the plumber comes out like the next day and they pay them to do it and whatever, but all yeah. that adds up and you know, we're in the music business in East Nashville. Um, I'm not like I pulled up here in a 1983 Datsun pickup truck that I've been driving for a while. I'm not like making all the money. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of hard work for just getting by. I mean, that's, it's a noble calling. Let's <laughs> say, yeah. And, uh, I mean, I have, I have such an affinity for club owners around the, we'll just say the country. We'll limit it to the country for now. Um, because of the authentic experiences they provide the unique, um, and ever changing experiences they provide for people. And, you know, in a world of increasing, um, sameness and duplication of experiences and the squelching of the human spirit, rock clubs stand apart from all of that. And it's a, not, um, it's not without its rewards, but the rewards are certainly not monetary because you can't scale it. You're not going to open a franchise of five spots, you know, it's antithetical to the cost, unless I'm putting an idea in your head that you might want to run we with. We can't because there's already f- five spots. Like every city has a five spot. Yeah. Not that I can even consider taking on another <laughs> business. Like, That's the only thing stopping you. The name is, ah, uh, yeah. I don't know how spot Cleveland, I don't know how people open up multiple locations. I guess they have a lot of financial backers and everyone does all the work for them. But instead of opening up another place, I just want to make improvements on this one place. Yeah. And that's like the opposite of the business mentality. Like if you're not growing, you're dying. It's like, I don't want to grow. Yes. I just want to stay right here. Yes. Like, that's all I want to do. I just, I just want to make, keep making this place nice and everything working. And yeah, you know, a hundred to 200 people can come in every night and just have fun and go home yeah. and leave a nice Google review. <laughs> I mean, is that so much to ask? Right. Like, I mean, do I have to open up another one in a, somewhere else and then open up another one and then do i have to keep doing that or to avoid uh just i mean i no is the answer please don't change a thing and as somebody who's played um their share of clubs and each of which has a different approach to everything once in a while you make a mistake and find yourself in some uh, corporatized environment right and the experience couldn't be less um, warm, hospitable, uh, genuine, um, inviting, artistic, uh, than a club that's just a one-off owned by a, a real person. It reminds me of the days of like the history of early rock and roll when it was l- local DJs that broke songs. You know, there was a person behind the choosing of whatever track got played on the air. And there's just something so much more meaningful about that than when, uh, what's the clear channel gets involved. And it's, you know, this is like even 10 years ago. Now it's just an algorithm on Spotify. It's all, it's so the machine man is ever encroaching and we we mere humans are fighting to like create a little space of, of genuine experience for ourselves and others. Yeah. 
So I feel like you're fighting the good fight, my man. Uh, like I I have like advertisements in the bathroom and some in the on the walls. You know, it's like it's called graffiti. I shouldn't even trash the company that's doing it. But sometimes I'm in there like, what are they advertising in here? Like, ugh. <laughs> like this doesn't right. Like, but yeah, we are being encroached upon. Um, this our style of club, like the medium size venue. Uh, by lots of the Live Nation sure. kind of heavy investors. Like, I don't want to trash talk any venue in town or anyone anywhere, but some of the ones that have recently reopened or are about to reopen have so much money behind them. Like, yeah. I don't... I, how does, how does little people compete? like me compete against something that's... Well, also, in from the perspective of the bands trying to play shows, I remember reading, it was in the scene, just maybe five years ago, give or take, um, you know, the Live Nation struck a deal with many clubs across the country. I know this mm-hmm. is kind of what you're talking about. Um, clubs, which won't be mentioned in this podcast right now, uh, were part and parcel with that. Right. And, you know, what that ha- what that resulted in was like an uptick in a service charge for the people buying tickets completely bullshit infuriates me makes my blood boil uh and for the other part it's just like for bands that are just wanting to play shows they're sort of excluded from the process if they're not part of the the existing machinery of the music business right you know i do understand like the 500 600 capacity and up venues doing this because it's hard to do that independently without having a whole network and that whole network was just kind of absorbed by one company yeah. to do all the booking, handle all the logistics. So if I had a 600 cap venue that I was running myself and someone came to me and was like, we will pay you and do all the booking and it's going to be packed to everyone every night and everyone in the city is going to love all the shows that they see here. Mm-hmm. I would be like, well, Okay. Here you go. Here you go. But I don't. Yeah. I'm a little place. There's no, not yet, no major companies buying up 200 capacity venues. Let's talk about it, a little anecdote here. Okay. Uh, there Sorry. was a few years ago, <laughs> I popped, no, this is related, because I'm just curious about what your take is on that, if you can offer one. But um, Lady Gaga played the five spot. Yes. This is, I, whenever this was, 17, 2017-ish. Right. Um, yes. And so I just, re- I didn't know, except that I was riding my bike past the club and I, I was like, what, what's going on here? There's a line all the way to the, to the five points intersection of people. Right. And I can't re- really remember, um, but it was maybe the next day or something. I had to go into the club, uh, ask you probably to play a show or something, but there was just like Bud Light posters on every single surface of right. the wall. Speaking um, of reco- little yeah. And, and I was just like, you know, great, you know, b- wonderful for Todd because you got a little payday. I, I, I guess I imagine yeah, yeah, you yeah. better have, uh, the sh- club got packed with people who wouldn't, you know, they were definitely from outside East Nashville, largely. Um, or it wasn't a normal, like, it, it was we a, were, not a normal, it was yeah, not a normal thing. Five we were crowd. rented out for a, basically a Bud Light commercial. Mm. And, uh, luckily it, the artist was Lady Gaga. We didn't even know. They didn't tell us. Mm-hmm. They were just like, what if we gave you this amount of money? Would you shut down for four days and let us do something special? And we said, yes. <laughs> and we used that money to pay all the bands that were supposed to be booked to play. All the bands were like, oh, we're going to get paid? Okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, and I found out it was Lady Gaga you know, a couple days before. I didn't really know who she was. Yeah, whatever. I knew of Lady Gaga. I remember she wore like a meat suit and that yeah. was about it. Yeah. So they're rehearsing. They got everything set up. They shut down the whole neighborhood. Like they bought up five I points. remember the trucks were everywhere. There's semis. trucks everywhere. Yeah. And look at like the stuff that people do now with just like tiny little cameras and it's all looks great. They had so many trucks. They brought in so much gear. They, it, they shut down a whole intersection. But... Anyway, so band comes in, they're rehearsing. They have like a body double for her that's up on stage doing dancing while they get the lights just sure. right. And because and so she's there all day 
Um, everyone clears out. The band comes, sits at the bar, and it's just me and the band. And we start having some drinks. And I'm talking to the body double who wants to drink Jameson. And I just asked her how she got into this. How did you get into this job of yours as being a body double for Lady Gaga? And she was like, she's like, I'm Lady Gaga. <laughs> And like, I didn't. I didn't even you didn't realize they like, were no, different people. No, you're not. And then the band was like, "Yeah, dude, this is actually her." Uh, then, so she, she must have been quite charmed. She was. I, we had a great time. Yeah, we had a fun night. Um, that was the rehearsal night, the night before she played. So we stayed up way too late, and it was just me and the band. Which one of the guys looked like the. Uh, Dennis from Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah. <clears throat> but we became good friends that night. I don't even remember his name anymore. I feel bad. But we all enjoyed ourselves. I f we finally leave. We left the drummer passed out on a table inside, locked up. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. But it was just weird. Like, I became friends with Lady Gaga for yeah. a night and, like, drank a whole lot of Jameson with her. Um and then she did her thing the next day, which was the Bud Light commercial, which was like live to YouTube. So were there those people that were waiting around the corner, were they extras for the commercial? They got like guests, uh, um, fan, they're in the fan club. Uh -huh. So they got like special tickets to come and be at the thing. So she did her recording for the commercial. And then when all that they cleared out, she let like a hundred some people just outside that didn't have that special pass to come in and she did another performance for them oh, wow. and then she t oh she also came and talked to my partner diane the original owner who was in a immobilized in a wheelchair she came over and hugged her and talked to her for that's a while that's pretty sweet and that lady loved lady gaga I, that's another thing meat suit and diane loves lady gaga uh -huh. that's all i knew about her so diane was so happy but she couldn't like express her talk she was yeah. just like a body in a wheelchair. Yeah. Like I could kind of see a smile forming. Yeah. So she was super happy. Diane didn't live much longer after that, but it was a very special night. Yeah. That's amazing. I'm like, glad I asked. Yeah. Yeah. Cause to me, it was a line of people outside. That's all I knew. Yeah. yeah. There was a whole other thing that happened. It was inside. fun. Yeah. yeah. And it's then beautiful. like two months later, all the people that I was just palling up with and drinking too much and making jokes and having a good time. They're at the Super Bowl halftime band. <laughs> and I'm at a friend's house watching the Super Bowl, just pointing at the screen like that Leonardo DiCaprio meme where he's on the, just pointing at the TV like, <laughs> like this. Like I did that the whole time. I'm like, that, that drummer slept. That, that, that guy <laughs> slept on the table all night and I locked him in the five spot. <laughs> and now he's on the Super Bowl halftime show. This is, it was wild. Amazing. It really was. Um, okay, I want to get back to some more highlights. Okay, wait. No, button but it up. Then she came back the next day. Yeah. After all that, when I just had a regular show. And there's... I forget who's playing, um, but she hung out and watched them. Hung out at the bar. Bought the band stuff. And then they all left. You know? That's, that's like, cool. Totally normal. Class act. Yeah. It was great. Um, let's have some more stories in a minute. Okay. But... Uh, I want to ask you, because this is when I pitched you for the for the show, uh, I, I wanted to know this from your perspective. I thought this would be helpful to, to people um, booking wherever, whatever venue is in their city, but particularly a five spot, which is that like, what don't artists understand about promotion and when they book a, a club gig, what are, what does a club owner want to see an artist do? that they in the club owners too busy to like express that to them. This is your moment. Uh -huh. Um, huh. so just, if you are an unknown person that's never played the scene before you, it's tough. You yeah. have to have a video of your band playing live. Uh, cause that's what you need to see. You need to send off like when you actually want to book the show it's like, what do you do? Send me a video. When do you want to do it? Send me some dates and I will reply with how we operate and which one do you want an early show or a late show? And it, but 
what a lot of people do. They just send me, Hey, I want to play a show on this date. Here's my Instagram account. And like, I don't even bother looking at those anymore. Mm. Uh, Are they doing so that many. because they look and how look and see how many followers I have, and then you'll know that. Yeah, I'm, but all that's fake now. Yeah, totally. So I can't. I've looked at people's Instagram pages and see them playing a guitar, and they have like two hundred thousand followers, and I get suckered in, and I do it, and like four people show up to see them. They're not really that good at playing their guitar and singing at the same time, but the Spotify music they sent me sounds really good because you can polish a turd these days. And so what people need to see now is a video of you playing what you're going to play on the stage when you get there. Like, this is what I'm going to do while I'm playing on your stage. And it doesn't matter if the, the video, the production quality is like top shelf. It could just be a phone. Just capture what, what you do. Right. Yeah. I mean, Nowadays, anyone can put a cell phone, a iPhone, or any phone that anybody has. It's going to be way b- better quality than anything you saw in like professionally done or not perfect. Like your buddy's got some good cameras and microphones in the early two thousands or even twenty twelve. Yeah. Like this thing buries that. Yeah, it's yeah. Rich. just set it down and just play, even if it's in your basement. <laughs> So, like, so you're making choices, aesthetic choices based on what you books to, I mean, that's, that's a surprise to me a little bit. I thought that club owners are so busy. They're just like, how many people are you going to bring? I don't even know or care how the music sounds. There's a, there's some of that. Yeah. Um, well for, for sure. someone, but there's I, still some <laughs> of like, do you suck or not? And there's, yeah, but like you'll watch how much of a through. video. Like, you're just like you're watching a video unless it's like blows your blows you away you're, right. you're kind of watching to be like okay this person is a legit right. artist who can competently be up on a stage and pl- right. get through a song yeah and sing in tune I, and play with rhythm yesterday <clears throat> or last night i saw the perfect example i should have brought an example like that or remembered who it was but the video was hey we're so-and-so from right here and the drummer's like one two three four and they play and it's good. And I watched a verse and a chorus and I was like, cool. That's it. Yeah. That's all I need to see. Yeah. People send me their recordings that they've done in studios, uh, and their social media pages where it's like what they ate or like a professional photographer picture of them, them holding a guitar. Like, it's like, yeah, they're like, I have 50,000 uh, followers on Instagram. And then you look at all the comments and the comments are all like, you know, spam, yeah. follow, uh, what's the one that's always promote this on Tennessee families or yeah. like, I see that all the time. It's all so fake. The only thing at this moment in time, I can't say in 10 years, it's going to be different. The only thing that's real is a video of what you're going to do on the stage. Yeah. If that's it. I mean, there's more to it. There's like being able to communicate properly a little bit. Right. But I, people don't understand they're talking to me and I am not like the most professional person. Like if it's the grammar's bad, I don't really care about that. You know? Yeah. Like, I just want to, you know. do want to see the, what will happen on stage yes. if they get the gig. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because so that's, I a... get, people get mad at me. If what happens on stage is like not mediocre, yes, mediocre is fine. (laughs) Mediocre is fine. Like if you're, you know, if it's, if you're charismatic enough and you you can be really good with a crowd, just talking to people, have lots of friends in the neighborhood, be a bar fly that could pack the place out and just Mm -hmm. play awful. Mm Mm-hmm. We get a lot of that. Yeah. And, you know, that's fun. Sure. It's still fun. Like, it's not, this guy is not going to be the next Bruce Springsteen or whatever. But we're all here having a party while he does what what he's doing up there. Okay. So 
maybe I wonder if there's two categories here. There's like an in town band and an out of town band. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so do you get out of town bands emailing you on their own behalf? And how many of them do you book? And what do they need to know too? Because they might see this. Because it's like, say they pass, you know, they send you the video Mm -hmm. and you're like, okay, these are competent. They're at at least mediocre. Um, You pull the trigger. Cool. Here's the date. We agree. What? what then I let me maybe preface this before you answer being like gut feeling is you're going to say hey do you know a local act that you can partner with right um, because nobody's going to come especially in Nashville maybe in other cities no. but nobody's going to come and see an out of town band they never heard of there's so, I know the like couple a, of regulars. I know a handful of people that are seeing music every night um, how yeah. many of okay. those people how many ish 20 I was going to say five. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you're a so-and-so band from Columbus, Ohio. Here's our video of us playing. Usually touring bands have a video nowadays. That's like, sta- it's becoming standard. standard. Yeah. So you can, and that just shows up at the bottom of the email. I can see their videos. And then if they say, we know this band and this band in town and I know those bands and they're fun. I'll book the show right away. If I like the music that they sent me, um, I will think about bands in town that they would pair with, but I'd still ask them what bands do you know in town mm-hmm. that can join you? Cause then it, they're doing a lot of the work for me, which is great because it takes so long I was going to say just the fact that you would spend time thinking about what bands might work with this out of town band. That is like a, a God bless your Christian soul kind of perspective. (laughs) That is insane, man. Um, Just imagine how long it takes. It's like, okay, I know the contact for this person. If I have to email a band, like they're going to get back to me in two weeks. You know, most of the, the better the band is, the longer it takes them to respond from their their band email. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why it is, but it takes a long time. Sometimes I'll have a band's phone number or I'll know where they work and I'll just go there for just to get a drink and be like, Hey, you, do you want to play this show? It'll be great. That works. But coming to me with bands that they know to add on to the bill with them, that's how you do it. Mm -hmm. Number one, number two, do a little research into the music scene. Like look up the Nashville scene of Cincinnati, whatever that's called, or each wherever you want to go, look into their local music media stuff, or somehow ask some questions to some people, you know, there to find out what bands are cool for what Mm -hmm. you do. And then if you don't know them, tell the venue, that you want to play with these bands, but you don't know them. And then the v- venue won't have to spend time thinking and yeah, contacting it's other help. acts. It's still, it's still yeah. I will contact them. And so it, cause otherwise no one's going to be there. Yeah. You got to have a local help yeah. to bring people. I mean, it would be great if every mid-sized venue in town could just book, yeah. you know, good music and then, people just show up sure every night and it's just packed and it's full i but, mean there are clubs like that in the country but they're not a usually open every you know six seven nights a week and b they're not in towns where there's just so much going on so this is a right. different this is kind of a hyper uh competitive experience yeah. for venues and artists alike i think that one takeaway that i just got from that is just like the more proactive an artist can be to and like understand the challenge and address it in advance they, they do themselves and the club and their experience yeah but that also goes wonders. to for your local shows as well yeah for sure but usually local people local bands if you came to me wanting to book a show you would say i want to play sometime around here hopefully this date with this person and this person mm. and i would say okay okay let's do it yeah, I feel like you uh, have what it takes to be a rock star, just in no. terms of the shrewd, no, talent aside, no. Though I don't know either way. No, I couldn't. I couldn't do it traveling around. Mm. I would snap. 
I tried it one time really quick, like being a touring a sound Touring engineer, engineer. Yeah. and I did not even, I lasted like two weeks. You just don't like, like van life or bus life and the, did not. the routine, which is no. funny because the venue experience has got to be pretty similar in a way. It's just all the traveling and the I'm hotel. very grounded. I have my house and I have my route to work and yeah. I spend a lot of time on this in those two places. Yeah. And I, and I love it and I like to make sure to fix both of them and make nice things for them. Yeah. I'm not the type of person that would travel around like 50,000 years ago. I probably wouldn't be a nomadic person. Wouldn't I'd be have. like, what if we just stayed right here? <laughs> totally. Guys, like why? This is a pretty good spot. This is a nice spot right here. Why do There's we have river? To, you got, we're just constantly walking around. Yeah. And then we stay in one spot for like a night and then we have to pack up and go. I did not like, what's the I point? I did not, do well i quit that job like live on stage during the band well it was the sound check when i really quit uh and it was great to quit yeah yeah that was the last thing i ever quit I, mean, I think one of the important you know important ingredients of a successful life is knowing what you are that Not was the last job does. i ever quit like yeah. i haven't quit this one yet but yeah i quit that one because the original owners of the five spot had just, <clears throat> they had lost their house in the tornado, like mm -hmm. I said earlier, and they were selling the club to Windows on the Cumberland. And I was mm -hmm. on the road with um, Hank the Third, just every night in a different city on a bus. And they tell me this when I'm on the phone in like California or Iowa. They tell me that they're selling the club to Windows on the Cumberland. And I was like, I you don't. Can't. Dude, don't sell the club. And I immediately called Travis up who I was working there with. I was like, don't let bones and Diane sell the club. I'm quitting. I'm coming back. I have an idea. So I came back. I stayed up for like, I don't know. I guess that night I called up some business friends that I knew other 27 year olds that kind of had their life together and had their own businesses. I was called them up. How did you do this? And yeah. they told me, just what I needed to do and got back to Nashville and was just like, Travis and I are going to buy in. So, but I quit, uh, that job during sound check and just cussed out the whole production crew that I was with at the time, which was one other guy. Basically I didn't get along with one guy, but <laughs> it didn't help that I didn't like the fact that I'm like, oh, wow, I'm in California, right on the beach. And they're like, yes, but you have to bring everything in and set everything up. And then after the show, you have to fix my guitar. I know you're not a guitar tech, but you have to fix this. And so yeah. there was one time we're on the road. This is in two weeks worth of stuff. It's not very long at all. Um, but long I was already like, I'm so mad. We're the, I know the ocean's nearby. I was looking at the beach. I didn't get to jump into the Pacific ocean. I grew up like an ocean kid. I want to go jump in the Pacific and I couldn't cause I had to work and it, but we were stopped on the side of the road and Joe Buck, the bass player comes on and he's like, Oh man, I was just down on the beach and the ocean sounds great. And I, realized we were stopped right there. I just took all my clothes off and jumped into the ocean. It was amazing. Uh, I quit the next day. I'm glad you got that in. Though. Yeah. It's the only time I've ever jumped in the Pacific ocean. Really? Was, yeah. Man. Uh, are you, so you were from the Atlantic side? Yes. Ocean city, Maryland. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So I quit that. Sorry. My story's, have like they go a g e f d there's i should try and work on that but um how did I, what were we talking about well <laughs> it was just the, the you knew you knew what you didn't want you quit out on the road right and you came back oh because you're a homebody i'm a homebody yeah and i i could say like i understand that i mean i've had i grew up in a little town in idaho and um, same house the whole time, then moved one time to the Pacific Northwest, went to college out in Seattle area and lived there for my whole twenties, had bands and stuff. And, um, all I wanted to do then was tour 
constantly and just i just my goal was like to i just want to know what it's like to be sick of touring impossible to do out of seattle and that's why i moved here and uh and then i got to do that and then i was finally sick of i mean i was there was a time in my life when i paid played 150 shows a year it's probably four or five years i was just constantly on the road and in hindsight it's just remarkable to me because i love this little spot right this neighborhood <laughs> and anytime we have to even cross the river i'm a little grumpy about it there's you know? so many great musicians that didn't leave their house and they never like um uh nilson harry nilson yeah right he didn't ever play a live show i didn't and, know that but and he's got i mean, i could be wrong but i'm pretty sure like maybe he got up and played once i don't think he ever played a live show he just made good music and people bought it it was great um i mean that's how uh, do it even when i first moved out of my parents house for college life uh when i ended up at mtsu in murfreesboro our house was where bands stayed so every band came and they played at the red rose which was a coffee shop uh kind of bar at night it's like a coffee shop that sold beer and they had shows at night and it yeah, was not acoustically I'm... treated at all uh but bingham the owner who's now grand palace do you know grand palace they do screen printing and lots of oh yeah okay uh, art stuff merch they're yeah. a merch company but he owned the Red Rose and many great bands were coming through and they would all come and stay at our house, at my house. And I would, I built like double decker couches and bunk beds for all the bands to stay. Um, so even in those young, like double decker couches, like a couch and then a space like and then another couch seating. Okay. Oh, no, okay. yeah. Like couch here and back and then another couch and all around the whole room. Got it. Yeah. And could, Lots of bands could sleep in there. I mean, think of a small band in the year 2001 that you probably saw at a rock club. Yes. Like they, they probably they crashed there, crashed at my house. Yeah. Um, you know, recently someone from the band party of helicopters was talking to me and I was like, you guys stayed at my house and you stole all my DVDs. <laughs> so no, <laughs> For 20 some years later, I'm not, I'm not going to book your band. I'm still <laughs> mad. But, yeah, dude. Uh, um, well, let's, uh, let's take a second to <laughs> look at some visual aids that you were kind enough to send me. Oh. And I thought that we could pull up a couple of pictures of Kyle can do it. And um, I think this is kind of a, a bit of a history or some highlights, some cool yeah. people that have played. And so, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but let's I, try. I never, I never take pictures. Sure. Um, I've never, I've, when I first started hanging out in Nashville nightclubs, like people weren't being like, oh my goodness, look at that famous person. I want to get a picture with them. Like that just wasn't a thing. Yeah. You didn't freak out when a famous person was nearby. You would be like, hey, can I get you a drink? Whatever. Treat mm -hmm. them like a normal person. They felt comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, so I never took pictures of people. Cameras. I'm always working. I'm sure there's lots of professional photographs in the world of stuff that happened, but I just didn't have them. Um, that makes these all the more special. I think. Uh, but now I'm, you know, it was when Anthony Bourdain came to uh, the edge field and everybody was getting selfies with him. I was like, it's over. Mm. This is famous. People are going to be treated like famous people around here now. That's yeah. How it it didn't used to be. Yeah, for sure. But that's Bobby bear. Um, a classic mainstay of the five spot. <laughs> the Bobby Bear Jr. is more of a mainstay. Uh, That's his dad. That's pretty cool. With Laura. Laura plays in Driving and Crying right now, uh -huh. which I was super into Driving and Crying in the 90s. And now this guy from Estonia, I think, is playing in the band. The country of Estonia? Or is that a band name? It's from the country. Okay. And I might be getting the wrong country. Well, but but it, it's like I mean, one of there's a whole contingent of like Pretty Russian sure Estonia. great pickers, pickers. So this could be that. He's great. Uh, I think this Brett Resnick on the lap steel. I can date stuff by what's hanging from the ceilings. And this is like <laughs> early 2014, maybe 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. And it's a candy cane on the ceiling, so it's winter time because I cover the ceiling with candy canes that I bought from the Dollar General and hooked up to my light switcher. And so they would bounce around with the stage lights and the party lights. So fun. Yeah. It's oh, nice. my goodness. It's one of those, those local touches. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> uh, Buddy Spiker lived behind us in what is now the Treehouse Restaurant, and he's like a pretty – he's a fiddle player. Um, yeah. Old Gray Whistle Test. Did you ever watch that? Yeah, with uh, Bob um, – the the British show yeah yeah with all the bands playing the intro yeah. theme song was his band okay um, uh, area code six one five they were called yeah I remember that, that. that you know weird things Chris Scruggs nice you know and the Buddy Spiker uh, that that used to be called the Fiddle Shop mm. is that the, is that was that the uh, Fiddle Shop was his house yes that's what I'm asking his wife he bought that in like the early seventies and then he bought the house next door for his wife to live in and his secret he'd be like the secret to a happy relationship is to buy your wife a separate house <laughs> ha 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 whatever <laughs> uh they don't get along but they're both still alive I think okay but I don't think they really get along that's why they have is he still or, he's still in the scene or is he <laughs> no, like in East I Nashville hope he's, he's doing going. well but I think he's just an old man on a couch his grandson uh opened up Pearl Diver and oh, wow. now the place next door so he's like neighborhood royalty in a way yeah for sure he is um he was cool let's see this is an old picture with i can uh, date it by the red and green light and that five spot drum there but this was just a normal night in the around 2010 to 2015 maybe it could be older than that no mm -hmm. that's margo price doing back backup vocals and yep. tristan yep. tristan owns anaconda village and I don't know if you ever listened to Tristan. I, you know, I played a show with her. Oh, she's yeah. my favorite. She's my daughter loves her also. Caitlin Rose is singing. This yep. is probably a country Western Wednesday uh -huh. that we used to do. There's another picture that corresponds with this. I think let's see. It's probably not in order though. Oh, Colin Hay from men at work. Yeah, sure. You know, yeah. it's a terrible picture, but, um, that's all I got. How did that li how did that uh, gig come about? Did we do people the, reach out or we do the Aussie Fest during Americana Fest, uh. the Aussie barbecue. Um, so it's the uh, um, Aussie Sounds uh, Sounds Australia is like a some type of group. Yes, it's a couple of fine gentlemen run, and they bring this party to America once a year. It's one of my favorite days. Hmm. It's mid-september but all day long it's just a room full of australians and australian singers and we got colin hay that night that's great uh legend yeah let's see who's that david only <clears throat> eh, oh, you know. rest in peace uh yeah david played all he played often and there's so many better pictures of him. Like John Partipillo has this picture of him playing with candy canes off in the distance. And it's just magical. But yeah, he just, he passed away right before the pandemic. Hit. Yeah. I remember a singer, a writer's writer. <clears throat> I played a show was, with him. Everyone was at his memorial and being like, <coughs> cause oh, of, right, cause you know, it's just, it was like March. Yeah. End of March. Maybe. That's like right when it was really happening. Right. The, we were shut down. Like, we, remember we had that tornado? Yeah. I, Goodness gracious. Uh, Franny Lee, which was East, she hung out there all the time. This is probably, this is Phil Kaufman's 75th birthday. Franny Lee was the uh, art director or something like that on Saturday Night Live. Oh, wow. And when it first started, so she made the Blues Brothers outfits. Hmm. Uh, they were originally in like, banana suits or something and they did this like business skit before and there was no time to change she was like just she put hats on them gave them a briefcase and was like go out and do your thing so That's how she happened. made land shark and they, she made the cone heads oh wow like came up with all this and yeah. made them the cone heads for that's crazy. But yeah, Franny was a staple. On the right or left? On the left. That's okay. Diane on the right oh, okay. who's the original owner. I was going left to right. Uh, original owner, she bought the building in the 90s. She made it a recording studio. So that's why the room is 
it sounds the way it does because it's a false wall on the back corner is like a false wall with a big air gap. The ceiling's all acoustic, acoustically sprayed with foam. And there's other little additional wall things. So being in studio that she ran, that walk-in cooler in the back was like the tracking room. <laughs> Is that still there, that cooler? Yeah, it became the tracking room again during the pandemic because wow. that's where we sat to do the audio mixes for the live streams. Gotcha. Because you would have bands in during the pandemic. They would be on the stage doing it. Yeah. Uh, well, let's get back to that, but okay. uh, more more pictures. Oh, Jerry Pentecost, oh, yeah. who was uh, the door guy there for a long time. People, he had a history of like basically live tweeting or whatever you called it back then of working the door. Uh, it's not an easy job to be a door person for big, crazy party nights, but he was there for a long time. One day he came to me and asked if he could do a country night on Wednesdays when everyone's in town uh, cuz he wanted to get better at playing country music. He I met him when he was we were both very young and he was in like kind of heavy emo screamo bands just like pop up like yeah. And then he kind of mellowed down. Worked the doors, one of the greatest drummers. He has to do a country night. It became Country Western Wednesdays and that went on for a a couple years and there was different guests all the time that's how we had like the bobby bears and lucinda and mm. it's like so many great people um that jerry hooked up or and jerry would meet all these people and everyone would bring these people in and he got better at playing country music he ended up playing with old crow medicine show and yeah, now he's bob dylan's drummer that's insane dude i didn't know that as of when the past year. Wow. Uh, he doesn't ever talk about that. We talk pretty regular. He comes over for yeah. our little parties and stuff. He's, I, I guess he, I don't know. He's playing with Bob Dylan. He's such That's a talented like, guy and he's such a, um, he's a genial guy. You know, like everybody loves Jerry Pentecost. Yeah. I remember him um, arranging like a deal at the Country Music Hall of Fame uh, with Headley and uh, it was a, a bunch of, you know, cats in the sort of, I mean, Headley is, is Joshua Headley's like modern day classic country music incarnate. He's so good. Right. There's a lot of people that are kind of peripherally involved that were part of that. But anyway, Jerry coordinated all that. And, Jerry's a very hard worker. Yeah. Um, and he would sit at the door and practice drums all night. Mm -hmm. And it really didn't bother anybody else. And then other drummers would come in and work the door and they'd be like, they'd do it. And everyone would be like, will you please stop? It's so annoying. And they're like, <laughs> but Jerry does it every night that he works. And we're like, we don't, <laughs> He's not we you. don't notice it. He must be somehow practicing along He's with better. music or something that's going on. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. He's like so in the pocket sitting at the door that it never bothered me. And how do you explain that to another person <clears throat> when they're like, you let this person do it. Yeah. You can't be like, well, I don't, I don't know what to tell you, man. They're, I let them do it. I'm not going to let you do it because it's annoying. Anyways, Jonathan Richmond. Uh, this young would, man didn't know who that was. Oh, right. Well, Jonathan Richmond would come and play two nights, a few years there. Uh, his old manager was Phil Kaufman, who lives in the neighborhood, who was the, the road mangler, the guy that burned Graham Parsons body in the desert. Oh wow, the uh, stuff of legend. You know, who yeah, I'm I know the about. story. So I didn't know. I didn't know the, who involved lived here in town. Phil Kaufman. Yeah, some of these pictures were from Phil Kaufman's seventy fifth birthday party. Mm. So I'm guessing he's probably over eighty five now. Wow. But he was Jonathan Richmond's manager, and so he brought him in, and um, just cool. Night. One of the special nights. Yeah. Yeah. Real quiet. Of Lily Hyatt from yeah. who knows? I mean, this is probably like 2007, eight. Wow. It's hard to tell. Maybe I can tell with a drum set. Nope. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Lily Hyatt. I sent a bunch of pictures. She's great. I don't She's know great. who's in her band. Oh, that's Dylan Napier playing drums back there. Uh, he plays with uh, Margot Price now. 
Oh, that's me in the background from the hit TV show. That's this picture made the cut. We and Kyle were wondering. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I it's came Raina in. It's Raina there. Um, and I'm the just, actress. you asked me to go through pictures and I'm no, like, why great, did man. I take a screen capture of it? But yeah, that's me in the background. That's my, my IMDB page <laughs> should have like Nashville background bartender many times, but that's me. Nice. How were those experiences? Did you enjoy them or were they just kind of the... It was one of those times where I follow around the camera guy. This mm-hmm. was even before we even thought about filming at the five spot, but mm-hmm. I would still follow people around, look at their gear. Everyone, all the tech guys would come in. What's really funny is that during all these shows and like music videos from professional people, like like, like Mary Steenberger, Berger. Yeah. That's like, am I saying her She's name timeless, right? But far, good enough for me. Okay. Ted Danson's yeah. wife, like, whoa, she's in there, sitting there all day doing a music video, and the whole crew, there's only the one bathroom, they're all ripping just gnarly dumps all day. <laughs> and so the room just smelled so bad. She had to sit right next to it, and she's first one to bring it up. And then during the same thing would happen during the, the TV show. And so recently there's been, like, a clause added that, people need an outdoor bathroom like the stars coming in need uh, an outdoor bathroom like a honey bucket or like maybe a trailer, a, a trailer they're nice bathroom yeah they're I've fancy seen yeah that's funny well <laughs> the last one i saw the, uh, i was like that's a good idea because these crew dudes are they do not eat healthy they're beasts yeah. they don't eat healthy no. and it's just shows with what they do to the building all day <laughs> from because the, they get there early they're there like 4 a.m chugging yeah. coffee you know yeah they did not have time yeah. before they left their house. And there's just the one the one toilet in there. It's for that for the dudes. Yeah. We have four, but two in each one. Four toilets that I have to cater to. Um sit down? Yes. Is we don't it, have any urinals in the men's room. Oh. Maybe I yeah, I guess I, that's the, right. Diane the original owner. I love how the door opens it. at the club and it's just like, you know, yeah. You might see a dong. <laughs> this, for real, the soundboard used to be at the other end of the bar. So that is a direct <clears throat> shot. Soundboard, bathroom door, small stall. Small stall opens up. Dudes just go in there and start peeing. So all night, I'm just sitting there running down like penis, penis, <laughs> penis, <laughs> penis. I've seen so many penises. Yeah. Just sitting there running sound. It's just... And, uh, that would not be at a corporate club. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's kind of local fixed color. now. It doesn't, it's not as, it's basically the same, but like the door, the way the door, it's not as bad. No. Oh. I'm just saying that it probably is. I'm, maybe that's an improvement. Maybe not. I don't but know. yeah, many penises. Look who this is. Emmy Lou, who, Phil, that's Phil Kaufman again. I guess all these pictures, I just couldn't pick one. So I just dragged a whole stack of them over, but it's Phil Kaufman. His chart says he's 75, so I can confirm that it's his 75th birthday. And he was Emmy Lou Harris's manager as well. And like so many people. So, yeah. like, I read his book. He has a book out about his life. Um, Worth reading? So, yeah, I mean. I mean, I, I, love, I love music history into that, stuff. You know, I, I totally am. I don't know. If it's not something happening in space with some, like, serious hard sci-fi going on, I fall asleep like it's tough yeah so i probably didn't read all of <laughs> coffin's book to be honest uh those darlings which was like a nashville staple and for, uh, uh, like right when the m- most recent scene of me arriving on nashville i feel like those darlings kind of came at the same time mm. and um was just one of my favorite bands. They started off like this, just three of them. Actually, I started off with them like stomping on boxes mm-hmm. while playing traditional country stuff. And then they kind of started getting heavier and Linwood started playing drums with them. And they just kind of became like a, one of my favorite rock bands. Uh, and then they got super artsy and broke up. And then... Uh, Jesse Zazu in the middle. Mm-hmm. She joined this band because uh, Kelly was the at the Nashville Rock and Roll te- uh, Southern Girls Rock and Roll Camp. The first year that they did this, have you heard of Southern Girls Rock and Roll no, Camp? I haven't. Uh, 
it's a camp in Murfreesboro for girls to go and learn how to form a band. Like they have to have some musical background probably, but you learn how to play guitar, bass, form a band, whatever. Okay. Jesse went to this camp the first <clears throat> year, met the counselors. They formed this band and then it just came out of that. So, uh, then Jesse ended up with cancer and died at a very young age. Yeah. Um, and it's, that's kind of depressing. I think about her a lot. We have the same birthday. Oh, wow. So I can't really be like, oh, it's my birthday. I mean, she's a, like, still a much loved and celebrated member of the community. I mean, she right. passed but a few There's years ago. There's still a foundation in her name mm-hmm. that people can donate to and it goes to good stuff. Did, um, did anybody else in the in those darlings go on, have a solo career? Or? No, Nikki's an artist in like England or something. And Kelly is doing um, she's doing good stuff i don't know what it is but i'm sure they're all still playing music but wow party cannon <laughs> uh, this is what like my beginning at the five spot like this is kind of what i picture was shows like this um this is not party cannon this is totally snake oh my goodness <laughs> okay totally snake we'll edit that out it's embarrassing <laughs> they same time as party cannon was a band called totally snake which was one of my favorite disasters ever like <laughs> these guys barely played a song all of their songs were like the anthem part of a song the chant the crowd chant it's like basically what the whole song was like they they had songs called like snakeskin socks and uh standing on the shoulders of snakes <laughs> and uh, uh i was drunk you know just stuff i have their set list they were not a band for very long but they're all friends they've all gone on to do interesting unique things uh, i have their set list probably from this show um on the wall behind the bar what an honor yeah yeah i keep few bands can say that yeah uh they were super fun the drummer now owns the bomb shelter recording studio which has done some grammy winning stuff Mm -hmm. um he's you know every single one of them uh, i can almost look at this picture and tell you what everyone's gone off in their life to do the beginning days back when we were we young 22 year olds no this would be 27 same thing the guitar player what's he doing which one uh the Brent? shirtless guy oh the shirtless guy which one i mean he's holding the guitar i think <laughs> man he's like in a tech company oh wow he grew up yeah he's doing great well fuck him that's it oh man uh <clears throat> Okay, well, let's add, dude. You've been talking forever. Thank you so much. Um, but I have a few more, few more, or maybe one more question to see where it goes. But uh, I, maybe the question is: Have you noticed a difference between people coming out to see shows, apart from like getting older, as people do? But like the crowds has have the crowds changed from when you started to now? Totally. In what way? Well, do you remember lots of people going to? like raves and that's being where most of the people go to like it seems like nowadays the edm shows are so packed and that's like the late that's what the late night crowd does Mm -hmm. our early shows lately have been doing great it's a whole new world um our early shows have had pretty good crowds out the late shows like a wednesday nine o'clock show people going on at 11 o'clock uh they have to really bring it and they have to really bust their butt to get people to come out and to stay there. Yeah. You know, people aren't staying out as late. We used yeah. to be kicking people out at two fifty-five. Like you have to leave. It's illegal and like <laughs> forcing people out. And that's people go to normal bars for that now, I guess like all the new dive bar theme bars that are opening up all around us. That's where the younger kids go to. And they're like, oh, it's so cool here. You know, whatever. Uh, So there's the amount of bands has dwindled because no one can afford to live in the neighborhood anymore. So they're Mm. making bands other places and they're playing 
There's just not D's. as many. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure D's, D's has it a little bit easier. It's more of a friendly neighborhood bar that just has like one band play for a while and another one play the, the later set. I don't know. I don't really know how they do stuff. But um, people are moving even further away. And yeah. They have uh, less disposable income because everything costs so much and they're, everyone's getting paid a little bit better, but still not quite enough. I don't know. When I moved to this neighborhood, it was three of us in a house all paying like $200 a month mm-hmm. in rent and stuff. And we had multiple bands. Bands would come record at our house and stuff. I used to drive home from the five spot to my house and hear bands coming out of every house. <laughs> and then now I come home and there's like strollers at every house or like a yeah. big, huge Jeep. that's so like, don't tread on me tags. <laughs> <laughs> in like a eight hundred thousand dollar duplex right on the train tracks just like maybe those people are going out and they are because i met one of those dudes out. Oh, that's right you were telling uh, me. it wasn't the don't tread on me jeep guy uh, i don't think that guy he might go to broadway i don't know but the whole dynamic has changed recently yeah and just how have you adapted or have you had to, or what have you done differently? And the, did this change happen before the pandemic or after or after really? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I feel like the pandemic made everybody just, sh- everything kind of shifted to two hours earlier or something. You know, it's like people, yes. I f- feel it and I'm off, but I'm old, but I don't, you know, stay out late. Um, but I think that there's just generally speaking, like restaurants aren't open that late anymore. Rest, I mean, the gas station and five points that used to be open till like four to get all the people buying beer when they're getting kicked out of the bars, they close at like 10 o'clock. It's crazy. So I don't, it's just strange. Yeah. Uh, we concentrate a little bit harder on the earlier shows mm-hmm. and more people are coming out to the early shows. I love the earlier shows, man. It's great. Yeah. You know, I can go see some of the best music ever when I'm not working, it's my night off. My wife's like, what should we do? I'm like, we should probably go to work and watch, uh, you know, she's got to love that play. She's like, okay, great. <laughs> and, w- and we do it. She loves it. I mean, she works there Mondays and no, Fridays, bartending, cool. yeah. but, um, concentrate more on the early shows and just try to, find what works for late night stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't know. People want to go to normal bars. I get it. Uh, but that's how it's always been. Like, yeah. People are like, dude, why are we so dead on a Wednesday night at midnight nowadays? And then I go through my brain. I'm like, we, we were always, turns out we were always dead on Wednesday nights at midnight. Yeah. It's just the way it always is. It's just, we're seeing more people late night. Like if I, go out to the new bar down the street at midnight on a Wednesday, it's packed. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool. But how do I get them to come out and watch someone playing some cool tunes just for them? (laughs) That's the challenge. And that's the, how the challenge has always been. What the soul nights do well or the dance. What was that? A Monday nights dance parties. Those got to like, those are still slamming, right? Yeah, They are. I don't understand it. I, kind of understood it when we started it in 2007 when me and some neighborhood friends were putting music on it from an iPod on a Monday night because we were closed and you know I had the keys to the place I'm like let's leave this bar and go back to the five spot and just put on some music and act like idiots and we did that one night and then the next Monday we did it again few Mondays later, there's like 40 of us and the bar's open. I'm no longer just like giving out drinks to my friends because we're closed. We were like, let's open and maybe make some money off of this. Uh, a month later, Nashville scene wrote up an article like the, the surprise party to be at is Monday nights at the five spot. And then the next week there was like 300 people there. And I was like, I cannot, I can't, I can't do this. This is too many people. <laughs> Surely next week that many people aren't going to show up. And then they just kept coming. That that was 20 years ago. And it hasn't stopped. Yeah. 
it's fun. It's a whole new crop of people. Like the kid, like it's another generation. It's we're, we're playing oldies music. Yeah. Great. That's it. Yeah, man. I mean, that's awesome. So like the, the takeaway is that you're, you're okay. The club's okay. Club's okay. It's always just been getting by. Yeah. And I think that's the only way, like if it made, if it did too well, then yeah, we you, might be you like, get lazy. We get lazy. You'd hire somebody else out to do your job and then you yeah. don't come down anymore. And yeah. And all of a sudden I'm someone else's, we're paying someone to get IDs out of the bottom of a toilet. Yeah. You don't want that. Yeah. It's or gotta be your hand in there. $600 to clean the coil of the beer cooler. Yeah. Like, yeah. You lose you have your to be, edge. You have you know? to be hands on at all times. Yeah. Well, it makes me feel like we're in good hands here in the community. And, you know, I just, uh, on behalf of all of us idiots who play music and make dreams come true in real time, um, thanks, man, for making this club so special and, and what it is. Yeah. And here's to another 20 years. Yeah. But I'm only here for people to have a good time. So, so far, so good. I'm trying. Hey, thanks for watching. Go ahead and click here to like and subscribe. You can click right there to watch another video or click here to watch a playlist featuring the songs of the Morse Code Podcast. Okay, thank you very much.